Welcome to today's episode of What to Say and How to Say It. We are on an adventure today as we're looking at how do you deepen your walk with God? How do you deepen your connections with your spouse and with God and with other people? And we have a special guest today. He's uh, Dr. Paul Lecomte. He is a doctor of veterinary medicine, and he's kind of a genius. <laughs> he's been there, done that in a lot of places, running businesses, and he's got a really brilliant story. He's the author of From Broken to Blessed. And we're going to talk today about um, how we get from one place to the other with the Lord, because that it is a wild journey. And it's just an exciting thing to be able to be here today and talk to you. Paul, thank you so much for being on the show today. Thank you, Nina, for the invitation. I'm so excited to talk. You know, we're kind of living as Christians, especially in a big, grander story, right? And um, it's exhilarating if you really can take it to heart and understand that we all have a little piece to play in this. And so sometimes we can't appreciate that until we've been through the fire and look back on it. So that's kind of what I've done in that book and with my life. And, you know, so it's pretty exciting just to be here with talking to you about it. No, oh, I'm I'm so glad. Yeah, I my first real exposure to you, and I've I've known you, kind of sort of known you, known of you, and been on a few rides uh, on Fridays with you. But I went to South Dakota with you and your wife and a bunch of other horse riders a couple of years ago, and um, th- I was really impressed with the way that you tell a story. And you got up one night and uh, brought some people into some reality for you, and that was just really moving. And that's the thing I like best about this book. From broken to blessed, a prodigal life. It's it's full of stories. Yes, you know i I have a ministry I started about four years ago called um, Go Show and Tell, and really, it, the heart of it is is sharing stories and Christ spoken stories, and the whole Bible is about stories, and and really the person who tells the best story really commands society it mm-hmm. commands culture and so we just as christians have to be good storytellers and um and that's the that's the heart of being a sharing the gospel is sharing part of that is christ's story but our stories as well and because our stories have meaning for other people mm-hmm. it's not easy it, you know it takes guts <laughs> to do it to lay it out there if you're going to be authentic and transparent but that's what i attempted to do in that book and i'll be honest we went every day that i was writing that book i said I can't let the know, world know all my warts and all my brokenness, but that's what's required, really, if we're going to be honest, right? Yeah, exactly. And your wife's a friend of mine. Um, she, as you know, and uh, she, when she saw you hand me the book, she was like, oh, I hope you still like us after this. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I had that in my head as I'm reading this and I'm expecting, you know, some sort of jail time or prison or like plot to murder the president or something. And it just never showed up. I'm like, I don't get it. I mean, it, uh-huh. there's a lot of drama in here. There's a lot of stuff. But honestly, I think it's normal Christian living. Yeah. But, but that's a perspective most people don't have. Right. Yeah. And and that's the, the ultimate foundation of the gospel is we're all broken. And anybody who tries to pretend like they're not just doesn't get it. And that's the problem with the world is they they think Christians are not supposed to be broken. So they call us hypocrites because we probably don't do a good enough job of saying yeah. broken we are before we start talking. Yeah. Right? Oh, yeah. 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 Been there, done that, bought the T-shirt. Yeah, me too. <laughs> right. And now I understand it differently. So I make sure to always say, and by the way, me too. At all yeah. this, you know. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so as we talk today, Nina, it's really important that our listeners if I sound like I've, we've arrived, me and Michelle, um, if we sound like we have it all together, we still don't. We're still on the journey and writing the story. And um, that that uh, it's you never reach it as Christians in our own individual walk and in our marriage. We don't arrive until we're gone. And then, you know, the Lord lets us come back to him and see how it's really supposed to be. Right. Yeah, no kidding. Oh. Yeah. Some days I kind of look for, forward to that um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> more than others. Right. But yeah. So uh, you guys have been married for a minute. 37 years. Yeah. That's, that's a few minutes right there. Mm-hmm. And um, this has not always been easy. Really been. Uh, it's the, gr- it's my greatest, uh, most, uh, most prideful part of my life or the thing I'm most, um, appreciative is our story because of where we were then mm-hmm. to see where we are today 
that's the only a God thing that could keep us to, to have kept us together through it, in my opinion. Yeah. So can you tell us more about that? Sure, I probably should give you a little backdrop on on just my walk with the Lord from the beginning. I was raised in a Catholic family. My dad was a career Air Force man, 28 years. Um, I uh, They had five kids. I'm in the middle of that. So we traveled all around the world and uh, good Catholic family. And I, as a young boy, I came to to um, love the Lord and know him as my Savior. And um, and the thing that was really, really cool is that he answered my prayers as a boy. It was it was the coolest thing. I didn't tell anybody. It's just like I had this secret that the world didn't know that he would. I would have silly things boys pray about, but he would answer my prayers. And so mm. I realized now that that was his signature to me as a boy. And when I was nine years old, I got exposed to pornography and that kind of tilted my world. And I then began living in two worlds. And yeah. I don't know if you've ever heard that story about them the parable about the um, the missionary who goes and he witnesses to an indigenous tribe of Indians and he wins the chief's soul to Christ and he goes away and comes back and he asks the chief how, it, you know, how it's going. And the chief responds, I have a battle in my soul between an evil dog and a good dog. And he asks, which one's winning? He says, the one I feed the most, right? Yeah, yeah. So that's what I was. I had these two dogs in my spirit and I was trying to live in two worlds. And it got to the point by the time I was 15 or 16 years old that that tension in that battle was so great that I had to make a decision and mm. I chose poorly. I chose to believe that God didn't exist and um, I didn't even have the guts to be an atheist. I just said I was an agnostic, you know, no one can know. But it changed the trajectory of my life because then life became real hard after that. That protection I had from God was gone. And um, that's the backdrop to how I met Michelle. So I became the poster child for secular humanism, right? Mm -hmm. Looked good on the outside. I did well in sports and school, but I was really selfish. I was just a selfish individual. And I it was about fulfilling my appetites. And as, as crude as that sounds, that's what it was. I had nothing else to live for but me. And, and um, I'm embarrassed to say it, but that's the truth. And so I get into veterinary school and I meet Michelle and we date for the first three years of veterinary school and then decided to get married. So if we were, if we were, went to you, Nina, for premarital counseling, you would say, because Michelle came, Michelle came into this, this situation with her own issues. Sure. She had a very um, hole in her heart for love and, and a mm -hmm. need for identity and, 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 and especially for love that I wasn't able to fill, but that was her need. And I come right. in with this selfish attitude and so we're really broken really broken people living together um before we were married so we're being intimate and um and it all came and so if we were counseling you'd say run from each other you guys are a <laughs> nightmare you're a train wreck yeah. <laughs> right? actually i wouldn't you're that's like every couple out there like no joke everybody's bringing baggage and everybody's got their selfishness like it, it just yeah, is it is so that's where we were, and we ended up getting married. And I got to tell you that our wedding night was a profound night of tragedy. So, you know, we get married, we hit the road, going to stay at a hotel before we get to our destination for our honeymoon. And I'm in my mindset thinking, oh, now that we're married, it's all legitimate. Let the party begin. And Michelle had this hopeful expectation that I would become the knight in her shiny armor. And that I would instantaneously change because I am the opposite of romantic. <laughs> I and my whole family, my whole origin family was very transactional. I mean, my mom and dad were married for 66 years before when my dad passed, but but they didn't have a romantic relationship. And it's not, I'm not criticizing them. They just didn't model. Yes, there were no dates, there were no flowers, there were no surprise presents. It was like on our birthdays, it was what do you want? Fishing pole, the jurors. You know, it was like everything was like the opposite of, of romance. And so mm -hmm. I didn't learn that. And I'm not blaming anybody but myself, but Michelle had this hope and she knew I didn't have it, but she still hoped that <laughs> yeah. I would change that night, right? Yeah. yeah. No wine, no flour, no nothing. I hate myself for it. And she was brokenhearted and we, 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 we fought and we argued and we didn't consummate our marriage for a long time. Mm. We just didn't. It mm -hmm. was like, Okay, we entered in to a 10 year intimacy desert oh, I'm where so we sorry. literally, yeah. we literally couldn't work it out. And um, 
I felt duped. She felt like hopeless that I was a not romantic and other things that to fill her heart. And um, really, it was, I still ask myself, how did we stay together? Especially if you think about how selfish I was. It was about my appetites, right? I wasn't yeah. a Christian. Yeah. So how did I last 10 years and how did she last? Well, I bettered myself in my career and accomplishments. And she, we raised, we, I, let's say we were intimate enough to have three kids. There you go. Yeah. 10 years, three times. Okay. So what, what is, what, what, how did we survive it? There's three ways, three, three things. One is um, our parents are, were both, her parents are both still alive and married for the past 60 years. And my parents married, you know, modeled staying together and fighting it out. So we had this model, this legacy, and you can't take that lightly. It is huge because it was in our subconscious. Mm -hmm. The second thing is the Lord is different as he made Michelle and me. He made us similar in some ways. And one in one of those ways is competitiveness. We do not like to lose. We like to win at everything <laughs> that we do. And and it was like to, to, to give up and to divorce was to lose. And we weren't going to lose come heck yeah. or high water. Right. So that helped us. But then I look back with that prism of time and say it was God. Because the mm -hmm. only way me being so selfish not to leave to get my needs met was that God was controlling it, yeah. right? He gave us just what scriptures say. He, he tempts you just enough that he knows you're not going to get go too far. So that's where we were. And we learned a couple lessons um, along the way of that 10 years. Um, like um, one was, so let, let's look at this analogy of a crucible, right? A crucible is a, a bowl that you apply a lot of pressure to something to break it up, right? Mm -hmm. To change its components. And so marriage is like a crucible. And we were in that crucible. And the world says when it gets too hot in there, just jump into another crucible. Right. And, well, we weren't going to do that because we were too competitive and we weren't going to lose. So then you have a choice. And every married couple out there who's really going at it has a choice. You can either just stay miserable in that crucible or you can change. Mm -hmm. And basically, you know, we decided we're going to try to change. We don't know how to go about it, but we started the process. And there's a couple of lessons we learned. One is that you can't change the other person. So a little story. We were probably six or seven years into that desert. And my boss at the time was a great guy that liked um, family dynamics and counseling and stuff. And so he had, there's a guy named John Bradshaw at the time. And he had a series on family dynamics. And he had it at his house and he invited me, Michelle, to come over. And, and I went over and watched it. Michelle wouldn't come, but it was great. But when I was watching it, everything I watched, I learned about, oh, that's Michelle. Oh, that's Michelle. Oh, that's Michelle's family, right? That that, that game, yep. right? Yep. And I kept going, Michelle, you got to come. You got to come. And she's like, ah, get away. And I'm like, and finally my boss, he was so wise. He goes, will you leave her alone and just come for yourself? So I did. Left her alone. Came, to my, came for myself. Learned a lot. Um, and about a year later, right outside our house, there's this little chapel. It's a wedding chapel. And they had on her billboard, John Bradshaw series, Tuesday night, 7 PM. And she goes, Paul, do you think you can get home from work at times? So we can go to that. And I went, Whoa. Yeah. But what changed? She goes, you did. And I said, Oh, so that was one of those lessons that we we've realized Michelle can't change me and I can't change her. So if we're going to change, it's going to be our own doing. So we started going to that and we made a real rule for ourselves. One is that when we went afterwards, we would go to a coffee shop or to the park and we would debrief. But when we debriefed, I could only say what I saw and how it related to me and my family of origin. And she could only do for her and her family of origin. So we didn't start doing this that right. cross attack, right? Yep. And it may create a safe place for us. So we're beginning to learn how to communicate and break down into change and create a safe place for us, right? So that's mm -hmm. one thing we learned. That's huge, by the way. Um, people pay us way too much money to figure that one thing out. So, you know, <laughs> that is that is a huge deal to not be focused on your spouse's behavior, but only focus on your own. And then the side effect of that is as we change, our spouse then becomes open to doing something like this for themselves. We see that all the time and it's miraculous. Nothing short of miraculous that the Lord showed you guys that. 
And don't you think that's the only way our, our really our Christian testimony changes the world? Because if we go at people like you need to change, it's yep. not going to change. Them. They're going to go like that. But if we say, hey, this is what my experience has been, I, that maybe not for you, that opens up the door for their heart and the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. to move in their heart too. So it, it works on all levels of storytelling. Oh, yes. Spot yeah. on. The second thing we learned in that first 10 years was also um, that you've got every person brings into his relationship or her relationship a bag of rocks, right? Mm -hmm. I call it a bag of rocks. And it comes from a book. I don't, I don't think it's in print. I don't know. But it's Greg, Greg Smalley. The name of it was The um, Marriage You Always Dreamed Of. And he talks about we each bring this bag of rocks in, our, our issues that make us dysfunctional. Michelle's was this hole in her heart. And mine was was selfishness and and this need to be a Napoleon complex. Like I need to be respected because I was a little kid and you're rough growing up in the military and you, you know I had to fight my way through life. And so I need to be respected. And so that tainted my relationships. And Michelle had her things and each one of us does that. Yeah. So what we had to be willing to do is go back in time and unpack these things that aren't always fun to do. And I'm not talking about bashing your parents and living back there forever right. you yep. go back there you learn and then you come back in and then the power of that is that we gave each other once we owned it okay i own it that is me that's my deficiency and there's more than one then you got to be able to give your spouse permission to say you can call me on my bag of rocks yeah yep. we're getting into this little game of arguing and the person sees it that this is not normal this is your bag of rocks perhaps we have to be willing to accept that mm -hmm. so it's rules of the game really important for us to do that so again you have to have a safe place to do that and you establish trust that we're not trying to hurt each other but man that was a big piece of the puzzle of learning how to communicate so, so that was our first 10 years can i ask you some questions around that sure. mm -hmm. were, were you guys um like were you conflict conflict cycling through that time you know, having difficulty getting along, or were you more avoidant? Mm. Um, the uh, the intimacy was avoidance. Right. Didn't talk about that. Um, but we had a lot of conflict too. So we did a combination. It was a so mixed bag. When you look back on this, how did you move from a space full of conflict to a space that had enough trust in it that <laughs> you could say to your spouse, hey, um, excuse me, I think that you're levying a rock a bag at my head here. You know, that's like, huh, can we try this again? Like, because there's a huge difference between, oh, we're in conflict all the time. And now I trust you enough to have to be able to give me feedback. And I'm going to listen to that. Like, what'd you guys do in that space? I guess the, that's a great question. And it's it. I guess the best way to explain it is that we go back to the competitiveness that we weren't going to quit so if that wasn't an option we were just going to keep trying until we figured out the pattern that worked and it was a continuous you know it mm -hmm. wasn't like a, you, you don't go in straight lines it, right. it was like up and then here and then up and then here so it's a staircase more than this yeah and it was just a, a it was just a constant um dedication to try to get better and work our way through the process and it was um you know and it's a little scary because you don't know how it's going to end and when you're in it you don't know when you're in the suffering you just can't yeah. see what part of the the plan god has for it right mm -hmm. just just crazy like that so would you guys have have conflict and and be like okay we that was terrible i'm so sorry and apologize and and do some repair or would you just mm -hmm. move on to the next conflict yeah we would repair some we learned okay. how to say I'm sorry, and we would learn how to, um, you know, we would learn how to back up to the beginning and start over. But excellent, we would do that. Yeah, but it wasn't, but it wasn't always, you know, it was always always easy to do that. Right. I, I would have to say that I hurt her heart way more than I ever wanted to, as I wanted to try to get <laughs> to the right yeah. place. And I got to tell you, Michelle was she was a, a tough, more, wonderful woman that I was working my rear end off of my practice i had i was playing some sports i was um I, I had started an amway business to try to make more money i was just you know the world according to paul was just miserable and i was like and she had the three kids and working part-time and she had some lupus medical issues and mm. she was 
I think what I put her through, and sometimes I cry to myself, my heart, that she was, you know, so strong to do all that. Wow. Well, and it seems like both of you were strong enough not to give up on the marriage or each other or God. Yeah. Yeah. So that's when I came, and then I came to the Lord. So that's the the next phase was, okay, Okay. the next 25 years was in in my mid thirties. Um, ironically if you want to know the story real quickly so i was in the amway business and now if it's a multi-level and it was it, for those who aren't familiar with it there was a you, you you're in business for yourself and you try to develop teams of people and business for themselves mm-hmm. and you create a network of people and um um ironically in there had a training system and in that system you read uh, 15 minutes from a book, a motivational book. You listened to an audio from someone who was successful. Mm-hmm. And then you went to these seminars. But the interesting thing is the, um, sorry about that. The the interesting thing is that the people who were really successful in this were evangelical Christians. And so what they did is they shared their testimony interweaved uh-huh. with their teaching. So yeah. here I am. Oh, I'm hearing this Christian talk. I'm like, oh, my gosh, I can't. Oh, no, no. I'll just ignore it. Mm-hmm. But you know what the Lord was doing? He was, <laughs> he was yeah. feeding the white dog that I had put in a cage in my mind. Yeah. Oh, right? love it. And he knew what he was doing. Oh, uh-huh. I'll just ignore it. Well, he was softening my heart. And then I was in a business situation. And I hadn't spoken to the Lord in 20 years. And I was in a business situation helping a couple get started. And something happened. And it was disastrous in their basement. And their, they got rejected by their brother and their best friend. And the guy was a professional insurance agent. He called 50 cold contacts every day for his business. Didn't have a problem being rejected by all but three of them. But in this setting, when he was calling for his own business with his family and friends, he got rejected. And he literally lost it. He was on the floor holding his gut crying in front of his wife and uh-huh. I was like in this little basement and, and I ran out of words I'm an answer man as a doctor I'm always given the answers yeah. and diagnosis right and I was I came to the end of myself mm. I came to the end of Paul Lecomte and I sat there in that little dark room and I said oh god I need you please do something mm-hmm. I'm out of words and the phone rings, and it was one of their best friends who heard they were starting a business and he wanted to know all about. It. And he jumped up and he's all happy. And my jaw was on the ground because remember, I hadn't said a prayer in 20 years. And remember, God's signature to me was yep. answered prayer. And he had answered my prayer. Boom. Boom. In the moment. And those of us who are, you know, that what doesn't happen. It just doesn't happen. And so I was back and we started our journey back with Christ. And Michelle had started going to church. And I um, joined her. And then from that, there was this thing called couples with kids. So we were all in our th- mid thirties. They all, mm-hmm. we all had kids and we started getting together. We're all new Christians and we really bonded. And from that, the men started meeting. Mm. We then tackled the pornography thing. Yeah. There was a book called Every Man's Battle, Steve Arterberg, yep. A New Life, wonderful ministry. That book saved our lives. And we all of us got dedicated as men to being getting healthy and getting right in that realm. And the Lord gave us victory over over pornography. And that was a really important part of the healing process mm-hmm. for Michelle, too, you know. Um, and so <clears throat> so that was that was key. And then then, then the journey continues because now you're in discipleship, learning what the Lord wants out of your life. And your marriage is going to follow along with those ebbs and flows as you learn more about the you know, what your marriage is supposed to look like and what it's supposed to be. Well, it's so, really interesting to see God's hand on all of this when you guys weren't even active believers, you know? Yes. That's just, yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. All of yeah, that has happened. And that the things that you tried and persevered over because he created you both with that competitive nature. I mean, that's almost funny. Yeah, it it is, and so some people, some people, if you're in despair because your spouse hasn't come along, you know yet, oh boy, you know he, he it's not too late, you know Michelle waited a long time for me to come back because she had started before I had in that process. Mm-hmm. Couple things that were helpful for us along that next twenty five years of our marriage as we continue to try to improve and grow was there was a book called His Needs Her Needs. Mm-hmm. The author was um, William 
Harley. And I'm not, I'm not sure if it's in print because it's pretty old, but that was where we began to learn about, you know, the needs of women versus the needs of men. You know, it sounds so basic and it is, but you still have to learn it. So that was really helpful for me. You know, everybody knows now about the five languages. And so we learned about that. And so we started to learn what each other needed. Um, counseling, where did that come into play? Every once in a while, we would, we got really stuck. We would see a counselor, you know, that's biblical, as you know, it's yep. what you do. You know, Bible calls us to share our burdens. You know, Bible says that the wisdom, you know, there's a wisdom in a multitude of counselors. It also says that a fool takes his counsel from everybody or nobody. So you got to mm -hmm. be wise, get the right kind of counsel. And uh, basically, um, the, that was uh, uh, important to, to, to use when the time was right. We even recently used a counselor and was very helpful in one situation. Um, in fact, if I could tell a story about a recent rough patch that we had. Sure, and this yeah. was not too long ago. It was like a year ago or maybe yeah. or, or a little two or two. And so we found ourselves like really arguing about every little thing. It was like, we're just at each other. It's like, what is this? And so um, I finally got to the point. I said, this is going to end. And what what is behind this? And then I remembered a teaching I heard years ago. But and it, and it had a business setting when I heard it. It said, the person said, do you want to be right or rich as you build a business? Because if you want to be rich, you don't can't always be right. Right. And so that I said, that applies to my marriage because hmm. most of the fights that we were having, it wasn't about the fight. Yeah. It was about who was right yeah. as we started to fight. Yeah. That Foolish sense? argument. <laughs> yes. It's yeah. like, so we might start, to, we might fight about A, but then yeah. we were like, who's right? And then yeah. the next day was the fight was about X, but who was right? That, that's what kept coming. So finally it dawned on me that the Lord, do, do you want to be right or do you want to be rich in your relationship? And mm -hmm. this is where scripture is so important because being peaceable really is a big deal to God. He talks about it all over the place. He talks about it in the church with Apostle Paul talking about having a peace in the church. He talks about turning another cheek as a form of, of, of peace. He said, you know, the Beatitudes, you know, blessed are the, the peaceful. Um, so he, he talks about it everywhere. And so I, he put duct tape in my, in my mind. So I got a roll of duct tape and I said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to shut my big mouth and I'm going to stop trying to be right. And the next time we ramp up, I'm going to carry, pull out this duct tape. And if I have to put it across my mouth, but I didn't have to just holding it did the mm -hmm. job. So yeah. I started not engaging and it only took three days. And in three days, she went from here in her engagement with me down to here each day. Mm -hmm. And after like the fourth day, I said, have you noticed something? She goes, yeah. What the hell's going on? I said, duct tape. I said, we can just solve every every relationship problem in the world with a roll of duct tape. We've got it all figured out. That is and the it, solution. It, is, it, is. <laughs> it really is. Yeah, it is. And it was transformative for us. It was uh -huh. like, oh, my gosh. Do you want to be right or do you want to be rich? Now, that doesn't mean you sweep everything under the rug right. in your relationship. We're not saying that. That's where wisdom comes into play. Where if you take issues and you sweep them under the rug, they become monsters down the road. Exactly. So it's not yeah. saying to do that. It's saying to be wise about what you need to deal with and deal it with kindness in the right mm -hmm. way and keep each other accountable in the right way. But you can't make everything a fight. Mm -hmm. So most things you're not fighting about the issue. You're fighting about who's right. Well, and once we get that in order, man, it's transformative too. It's it's remarkable. I mean, you're talking about transformation here and, you know, from being so selfish as you described yourself at the beginning of this journey. And then to get to this point where you're not thinking about your selfish stuff, you're not going to put that duct tape over your wife's mouth. Right. That wouldn't have gone well, probably. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Not an answer. But you're, you're doing the right thing by, you know, having self-control, which is a fruit of the spirit. Yes. And. I I don't know, forgive me, I don't know where it is in the Bible, but there is somewhere in there that says it is the man's responsibility to stop the fighting if there's fighting. Hmm. It's his responsibility to create peace in that household. It is that man's responsibility to start that process when it's when all hell's breaking loose. 
And um, I, I got to find out where that is because it, yeah. it, when, you know, when I read that, it struck me. It's like, whoa. And I forgot about that sometime. You, know, you forget about that. So that's an important reminder. Yeah, it is. I'd love to hear about that when you have a moment to send that to me. We'll we'll put okay. it in the write-up. <laughs> yeah, I'll one. find out where that is. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So you guys, um, you also make the point with this that um, we're not perfect. Uh you know, you, you talked about that earlier on, but you know, here it is two years ago, year ago, whatever it is, and you're yeah. still having, you know, so the truth is, is that unless we're paying attention, unless we're intentional and, and working on it, that happens. It's normal to go from having something good and have it slide into wait, wait what we're doing this again. I, I think that's the enemy's path yeah. for us. Like he just gets us again when we're not Nina. That is so important because you don't arrive. And if you let your guard down, so yeah. we, Michelle and I knew that we would be, when we made this agreement to talk with you, I knew that we'd be attacked, right? It's just, that's the way of the world. It's the yeah. way of the spiritual warfare. Mm -hmm. And even this, this, even this morning. So I actually used something that we learned in counseling the last time that I, at the time I thought, oh, it's so silly because it was just a communication tool, right? And, mm -hmm. and the counselor told us, well, when you're getting misunderstanding each other, you're, another version of trying to get clarity is say the story I'm telling myself. And mm -hmm. when the counselor told me that, so if I'm confused, I say, Michelle, the story I'm telling myself from what you're saying is this. So it's clarifying, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And I thought, oh, gosh, yeah. Okay, counselor. Yeah. But it, <laughs> I tried it a lot and it works fantastic. Yeah, it's great. It's so great. Even, even last night, we Michelle and I had a misunderstanding this morning. She comes to me. And I, and I said, wait a minute, the story I'm telling myself is, and we just cleared it up. Yeah. It was like, it was like, I, cause I knew, you know, the attack was coming and it was uh -huh. like this morning and it was great that we use a technique that we use from a counselor that I was kind of poo-pooing and making fun of. And there it was helping us out in the moment. Yep. And yeah, and it, and it never stops. You've always got to be on guard, especially the more you grow in your faith and the more effective you become for the Lord he's not going after somebody who's not having any impact on the spiritual war. He's going after the people who are going to make an impact. And our, our, our marriages give a reason for hope. If we do it right, mm -hmm. people are supposed to be attracted to couples. And aren't we all attracted to couples who, who show that, that love for each other that, yep. that we all desire. Yeah. Yeah. I, I recently, uh, the husband of a couple I admired uh, passed away. And part of the reason I really like them is they're from Great Britain and they I love to listen to them speak. <laughs> it's yeah. just delightful. Um, but the, they were just so sweet to each other uh, all the time. Just I never saw either of them raise their voice at the other. And when somebody would say something that was off or whatever, there'd be a, oh, oh, honey, you know, you might be right about that. But I wonder if, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> it was just oh. so gentle. And I can't do the axe. Actually, it was Scotland that they were from. Yeah. Well, Those are beautiful words. Isn't that beautifully how that she's framing the yeah. whole context of gentleness, but yeah. truth, you know, that's just, that's an art. Yeah, it is. It really is an art. And I think it's a lost art because if you turn on, if you uh, look at the television or ooh, news, yeah, right. any kind of world. media, like, oh, we need a shower yeah. afterwards. And then yeah. everybody's shooting at you. That's right. Awful. Yeah. Yeah. Awful stuff. Yeah. So what else? So I have a, I have a few. Th so as we were preparing for this, I said I had a few thoughts, and then I said, if someone asked me, came up to me, a young person, and said, "Well, what do you think the the keys to staying married are?" And, and so I had a little list I did. If I if you could yeah, humor yeah. me, so first yeah. I'll give the thoughts. I just wrote down a couple of thoughts. One was, marriage is the one of the greatest roads to self discovery. If you do it right, it exposes your brokenness and your need for forgiveness. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Also, my greatest joy in my life is my marriage because my one of my Michelle's favorite quotes is from Helen Keller: "Life is a daring adventure, or nothing at all." And if you see what she does on a horse, you can know, she embodies that. I think. Yes. Um, and uh, to see where we started to where we are now, that can only be God that got us here because we're really in a in a nice place of oneness and mm -hmm. and intimacy that I didn't think we would ever be at. So that's just a beautiful God thing. Um, the meaning of marriage is best understood when you understand the meaning of life and when in 
Rick Warren wrote a famous book called The Purpose Driven Life. And the very first sentence says it all. And it says, it's not about you. Yeah. Right. And when you realize that your yeah. life and your marriage isn't about you, you can start living. Mm -hmm. And so if I had to say, what are the, what are the, the keys to staying married? So I'd say the, the most important is understanding the purpose of life. And so it sounds kind of silly. As a veterinarian, we have to take, I have to take complex concepts and medical conditions, and I have to boil them down into very basics that I can then explain to a client so they can, a pet owner can make a decision that's right for their family, right? Mm -hmm. I got to do that every day. So personally, Paul LeCompte simplifies everything in my world. I've got to take the complex and make it simple for me because that's how my brain works, okay? And when I became a Christian, I started the same process. So every day I read a little bit of Old Testament, a little bit of New Testament. I work my way, way through, through both books. Mm -hmm. And I keep notes. And so I see patterns. I look for patterns in the Simplify. And in my book, I and this is for me more than anybody else. And it's not rocket science. The, every theologian comes to the same conclusion. And basically, so what is the purpose of life? And it's to, when you read scripture, it's to glorify God with all your heart, soul, soul, body, and mind, right? Well, how do you do that? You surrender, then you submit to him, and then you obey him. Yeah. And how do you obey him comes from learning what his stories tell you to do for yeah. life. So that's the most important thing in life. The second thing is love your neighbor as yourself. So you die to yourself, you love your neighbor, right? And then and that's relational, that's horizontal. So vertical with God, horizontal with your people, most important of which is your wife. And then number three is you share the good news. You should be a witness through your words and through your life. And so to me, that's okay. That's the foundations. That's the core values of life. So at my vet hospital, we have core values. And when there are issues and problems, how we solve them is we go, well, what are the core values do to tell us how we're supposed to conduct business. So in life, what are the core values of Christianity so I know how to solve the problems of my Christian walk and my marriage, my relationship with my kids, my relationships at work? And so that is those three things. And so when I'm in a pickle in my marriage, I got to ask myself, am I glorifying God and loving him with all my heart, soul, and body, and mind through the marriage? Am I loving my neighbor? And am I witnessing to the world? See how I, so I have to make my life simple if I'm going to solve problems. And so and when it's confusing out there, boil it down to the basics and apply everything to that standard. So that's number one thing. And if you don't, why does the scripture tell us to be equally yoked? If you can be, because if you don't, if one person thinks, well, the marriage purpose is just for my, my whims or whatever it is, and one person is living for God, you're on, you're playing two different games. Yeah. If you don't have the same purpose, then one's playing football, one's playing baseball, they don't even have the same rules of the same field. How mm -hmm. can you come together and have oneness? So you have to have an understanding. And if you're a Christian, I implore you to understand the purpose of everything that you think, say, and do, because that is the foundation of which you build it. Then the next thing would be um, own your bag of rocks and change <laughs> yourself right yeah number three would be learn to communicate you know that difference between um communicating with love and don't sweep stuff under the rug but you know learn how to do it the right way to the point to your story about the scottish couple that was so beautiful words together number four would be get a phd in your spouse learn what they love learn what makes them tick learn these things now man you have a greater challenge why because your wife is dynamic. She's not going to be the same today as she is tomorrow. I'm sorry. That's a polite way of saying we're complicated, which you're co you're I, complicated. I admit freely. Yes, we are chaos. Like for real. But isn't that part of the adventure? It is. Yeah. Men are very simple. They're just yeah. a couple of things they need, right? Yeah. But I love men because they are so simple. Like it, it's amazing. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> yeah. Because imagine if it was both were equally complicated but they are in their own way but they're right. different so it's mm -hmm. different enough where he makes it work so get a phd in your spouse and always try to improve and and meet her needs um number five would be do you want to be right or you want to be rich mm. and then number six would be um learn the most powerful words in the world i'm sorry and i love you and then i guess i would end with this little bit of philosophy that says in the end 
for most of us, our marriages are our greatest ministry. And why? It's because it's where we learn to love, to repent, to forgive, to say I'm sorry, and to die to self. And I guess it's where we obey Christ when he says, to follow me, you must die to yourself and take up your cross. I guess the marriage is where that plays out the most. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Hope wow. that helps. It, that, that, you know, that's all really amazing. I love the part where you talked about uh, the core values as a Christian. Um, you know, it's so much, we do that in our marriage intensive. We get people to dig into the Bible about what are, what are God's core values and how does that apply to your family? And they create this thing called a family manifesto mm. um, because companies do this all the time, right? Like yeah. our corporation has a manifesto. Like we know who we are. It's, it's these known just not even spoken half the time cultural things that happen sometimes they end up on a big old board you know in the hallway of the office um but companies are really intentional about that but we're not as people we think it just happens and it does but it's the wrong culture yeah so that's a very cool point and one of the things i really enjoyed about reading the book is, is the, there's so much journey in here with business stuff um i'm i, I love watching the parallels between how God works in business to how he works in a marriage. And, and, and I think that's very appealing to men. Um, but I, I don't think that's an obvious thing for people to see some of those correlations. Do you know, does that make sense to you at all? Or am I like, no, no, you're so, you're so intuitive to pick that up, you know, cause I don't think, I don't think most people do. And, um, we 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 come, we don't, we tend to compartmentalize like to compartmentalize our lives, right? So we don't think of it all being intertwined and interreacted. But as we started to get our, um, as we had a desire to obey, to surrender, submit, and obey in our lives, Michelle and I together corporately as a marriage, and the rest of our life follows suit. That wasn't just our marriage. I wanted to do that with my business. I wanted to do it with everything that we did, right? And he honors that. So mm -hmm. while Michelle and I were not well put together to begin with as we started to have a desire to obey god then the things that he really synced us up together really started to come forward and 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 i gotta i always have to tread very lightly on this part of it because you're not supposed to right hand's not supposed to what the left hand does but i can't tell my story if i can be true if i didn't admit that the where the place that michelle and i were the most congruent was in generosity he gave Michelle a really generous heart and me as well. And as we got our act together, he, so this isn't the prosperity gospel. This was right. just him being true to his promises that he will give us a life and give us abundantly if we have our priorities right. So when we didn't have money, money, we were generous with it. And he honored that. And he did some business things. I mean, I got a like story after story in the business realm that just keeps happening that it can't make sense that, right that i'm not this smart it's not me <laughs> like, he's done this yeah and so in the book i describe those business things that you're making yeah. reference to and i just i love telling the story because it becomes very obvious that these things i couldn't manipulate it was god making this mm -hmm. happen and mm -hmm. the money just you know kept going and so we got out of our 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 poor life and became blessed in that realm. And now we get to bless things in little tiny things. Like one day we were having some work done on our front and, um, and these guys were working really hard, hot summer day. And, and I can't, I was coming home from work and the Lord put on my heart, you know, you need to tip each one of those guys a hundred bucks. So I could walk in the door and I said, Michelle, I think we should te teach each one a hundred bucks. He goes, already did it. <laughs> Is that not cool? That's oneness right there. That's, oh, that's just already beautiful. Did yeah. Already did it. Yeah, her heart is the same one that I had on my heart, right? Mm -hmm. So once you sink up in there, so he's allows us to, he's, he's, and we didn't see that 30 years ago when we right. were in the desert for 10 years in the desert that we would be doing this one day. So, mm -hmm. and she's been so great. Michelle has been so great. You know, I'm a kind of a dreamer if you haven't kind of picked <laughs> up on that yet. So I get yep. some ideas and she's always been the, perfect balance like uh, of encouragement and that yeah, yeah, reining me in so like in the early days I wasn't a very confident businessman and she's like Paul you can do it you can do it you don't need anybody else you can do it right and she was my greatest encourager and men need that boy yeah. they they need that they need their wife 
to be behind them, backing them up in the, in, out there in the world. And, and, and I'll be very transparent. One of the first counselors we ever saw during that 10 years in the desert wasn't a Christian woman, but she was older and very wise. And she told Michelle, your husband is uh, going to have a hard time competing in that world if he can't even win you over in bedroom. And that was like, wow, that's not easy for Michelle to hear, right? Yeah, yeah. But it was the truth. It's like guys are out there trying to win. There is nothing I live more for than to hear my wife one day, and you know, she hints at it, that you're the man. Mm-hmm. You're the man, because that's what, you know, what is it? They say men will launch ships across the ocean for a woman, right? And whatever, these ty- but there's true. Mm-hmm. I want to win the respect of my wife so she says, you're the man. And um, and so and I'm going off on these rabbit trails, but that's kind of, and then, and then with this go show and tell business. So we were blessed to have uh, this ministry, I should say. And the Lord put it on my heart that I needed to start this ministry. And we had just happened to um, come into some money from a partial business sale. So there's a lot of money so we could do it. And she didn't say no. She just said, if your Holy Spirit's telling you to do that, you got to obey him. And so to have a wife mm-hmm. that's willing to back up and, and, and she said, it's not my thing. I'll help you, but it's your thing. And, you know, and so she's willing to go on this adventure yeah. with me. Yeah. And she encouraged me and she challenges me in all kinds of ways. Cause part of being a good spouse is you challenge each other to grow. Like I don't yeah. ride horses, but you know, I knew it was important to her. If you know, as couples, you should get an interest in something else your spouse is doing if it's yeah. not yours. And that was horse riding. And so if it, okay, I'll go with you and I'll learn how to ride a horse a little bit and at least stay on most of the time. And, you know, it's it's led to some fantastic times together. I seeing views in South Dakota, Black Hills, I would have never seen if I didn't take mm-hmm. that plunger. I get to fish in areas I would have never fished if yeah. she didn't encourage me. And then, you know, me challenging, I challenge her to grow in areas that aren't quite so physical, but they're more emotional. And mm-hmm. so, you know, we that's what we're supposed to do. That's why it gives you a helpmate. And <laughs> I guess the final little piece of advice is. You got to learn to laugh at yourself. So the other day we we're going to church and we're driving it the night before. I have a problem with piles. I have piles of papers everywhere, right? That's how my brain is. I got piles everywhere. <laughs> it's a terrible way to be. And so, um, and I always, it, so it was Sunday morning, we're driving and I used an excuse. I said, oh, I have so many piles because I don't have any folders. And it was such a boy thing to say, <laughs> <laughs> right? And I triggered her a moment. And she gets triggered because this is a long history of pile talk, right? Okay, okay, yeah. Oh, so that makes sense. And so she's triggered and she's going off and I take the phone and I go, yeah, I'm just showing my friends my helpmate, you know? Oh. <laughs> and, she's, and she's going, but I really wasn't doing it. But yeah, we yeah. just started laughing because yep. I was acting like a two-year-old about the excuses. And then she's going off yep. like, you know, and it was just a perfect picture of how still broken we are, but how we can laugh at yep. each other as we as we go back into these little episodes of being immature. So. Well, and, and and that is, it's funny, but it's like maturity and immaturity, right? Because yeah. 20 years ago, that would have been real and that would have been a real fight. <laughs> yeah, exactly. In yeah. fact, we told it when we got to church, to home church, and so there's only a few people and we told it, they said the exact same thing. Yeah. They said, man, that would, we would have probably been launched into a World War III if that was us because, yeah. you know. So, yeah. One of the, was, one of the stories I wanted to, I wanted to hear you tell this aloud. Um, it's very selfish of me. I'm just going to tell you that up front. It doesn't have anything to do with marriage or maybe it does. I'm not sure. I'll leave that for you. But there's this story in here about a Rottweiler puppy. Yes. Oh, yes. So we had a practice in Blanchester and uh, a community in Blanchester. And it's, it's a, a, a poor, a poorer community. So, the cases that you see can be very complex and there's not a lot of funds for it. That's the backdrop. And so we had a beloved Rottweiler, Michelle's favorite dog of our entire marriage, our entire life was this Rottweiler that was just a special dog for her because where she was in life when this dog was in her life. And, um, oh no, I'm sorry. Let me, let me rewind. Um, we had lost our dog, our other dogs, and then we were looking for a dog, and she wanted a Rottweiler. Sorry, 
So that's the backdrop to this story. So she was wanting one. And at, at that time, we were still kind of tight with money, didn't have much extra money. And we started researching them and they're pretty expensive, right? Yeah. 2500 or something like that. And so she said, and she, she said a prayer to God. She said, if you want me to have a Rottweiler, you got to bring me one. And we had a practice in Blanchester and, you know, a little bit of an impoverished community. And this gal brings in, and a, a few days later, brings in a Rottweiler that had just had puppies. And she was emaciated. She was, this dog was probably half her weight, mm. terrible condition. These puppies were a few days old. And she's in the exam room. The lady's in the exam room with her dog. And the technician goes in, and this dog was so starving and then stressed from the visit yeah. that she put one of the puppies in her mouth and started to swallow it. And the technician runs out and goes, Dr. Valley, Dr. Valley, Michelle's doctor name, um, the, come in here. So Michelle goes into the room, sees what's happening, puts her arm around this strange Rottweiler's head, and then sticks her hand down and pulls this puppy out from the back throat of this dog as it was swallowing this dog from anxiety and hunger. Yeah. And long story short, this woman didn't have any money. So we bartered with her and said, we'll take care of these puppies for you as long as we can have one. And that was the God, that was the brought water that God brought to Michelle. And she <laughs> had just prayed, you need to bring one. I wouldn't the, listen, I've been practicing for 37 years, never seen a situation like that. And then yeah. the answer is prayer. So isn't yeah. that a cool story? Oh, you can't make that stuff up. Like it just happens all over the place. And and I, I think the big key here, the theme is, you know, the the whole surrender piece and <laughs> obey. And you had another one in there. I'm, I'm, submit, submit, surrender, submit, obey. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And what's amazing is that he's always listening, right? So when we ask, yeah. which we should, right? Yeah, he already knows the desires of our heart, but he, I believe he wants us to ask. He, he says, ask, seek. He, he does. Yeah. He's yeah. intentional about it. He says, ask. And, and he, and he, he, he really, um, I think if we understood how serious he was about answering those prayers, as long as it's aligning with his bigger mm -hmm. story for us. Yeah. We understand we're in a story. Yep. Then we know we're not afraid to ask, but we also are willing to accept the results of that. And, um, you know, her intentions for a dog wasn't selfish. It was like the next stage of her life. And she was trying mm -hmm. to be a good steward of her money, right? Okay, I'm not going to spend that money. But if you want me to have one, I'll, you'll bring it to me. And he honored that. So it fit. And and God loves stories because who knows? That's one, one of, in, in Go Show and Tell, we have a short stories book. And we have videos and we want to tell that story just so pe there might be someone who hears that story and says, my gosh, there, there is a God. They don't mm -hmm. believe there's a God. And they can hear these answers to prayer, the story of my answered prayer. And that might be the tipping point, right? For mm -hmm. someone's heart to open up so the Holy Spirit can move in. Yeah. So each Christian has a story. Even if you don't think it's dramatic, it doesn't matter what the drama of the story. It matters that it's attached to your identity, yes. to who you are. Yeah. And even if it's not dramatic, the point is you can thank God for something and for Jesus for something in your walk. And when you talk about that story, it could resonate with someone who needs the mm -hmm. Holy Spirit, the door open so the Holy Spirit can move in. We're not doing it. The story right. is just part of that. And it's scriptural. We're, you know, in John, the end of the book of John, when he, the Lord, it always perplexed me was that, it says that it, all the things that Jesus did were written down and all the books in the world couldn't hold it, right? That's what he was speaking about. It's like all the Christian stories that are going to build out in the next 2,000 years, they're so plentiful if we are not afraid to say them. Yep. And there's a there's a, a lot of Christians are reluctant to share their story because they think it's about them. It's not. Mm -hmm. It's about God. Yeah. And how Go Show and Tell you even got started. Can I tell that story real quick? Yeah, then, yeah. Mm -hmm. I wanted you to do that because, I mean, you guys have done such a great job of seek ye first the kingdom of God and then all these things will be given to you. Yeah. So, you know, and this is part of that. This is a thing that he gave you. So, yeah, tell us about that and how people can taste and see. So we, in 2011, we had a, um, 
you know, so we have a tradition in our family on New Year's Day, we get together, the kids, and we all write down our, our New Year's resolution, but we also review last year's and we made it a process and everybody really enjoys doing it. It's quite, it's quite a, a fun thing to do. And it's uh, one of the keys to success is putting your dreams down on paper. Mm -hmm. So in 2011, I, the Lord put on my heart that I need to put on there that I'd be willing to share my victory over pornography and share it with other men. Okay, Lord, you really want me to do that? All right. So I trepidatiously wrote it down on my list, right? Mm -hmm. Two days later was the first day back to work, January 3rd. And one of my clients, Doug Ross, had his dog Taffy comes in and we're sitting there. And I see his dog and we do our thing. And he knew me over the years. I used my office as a ministry and I sure we talk stuff with people, fellow Christians. And so he knew my story and um, my victory over pornography. And so he's ready to leave, turns around, is walking out, stops, turns back around and goes, oh, by the way, will you share your story with my men's group at my church? <laughs> I said, Lord. Lord, you give me two days. I just wrote it down. What are you doing? So I said, sure. Yeah. Right. And inside yeah. I was like, oh my gosh. So um, so we couldn't set it up for like two months or March, sometime in March. And so the devil started working on my soul. Mm -hmm. You're gonna share with men, men you don't even know, men in the community about your oh, you gotta be kidding. He was working on me. So it got to the point where the day before. I was like, Lord, you've got to get me to do this or I'm going to have to cancel. I don't know if I could do this. And in the morning readings on Wednesday morning, never forget, I was in Luke. And it was Luke 8. And it was the story of him going into the catacombs and the guy that was possessed by 2,000 demons called him Legion. And the guy, and Jesus exercised him. They ran into the swine. The swine all go drown, right? The guy was so happy to be normal that he said to Christ, Lord, can I, I, I want to follow you. And the Lord said, go and show your people the great things God has done. Show. So I flip over to Mark, same story. Christ says to him, go and tell the great things God has done. Go and tell. Well, in the moment, I was like, oh, my goodness. I'm, I'm, I'm the man with the demons. It's not about me. It's about God. He helped cure me. What am I thinking of? It's not me. It's God. Come on, Paul, get your act together. And I went with great happiness. He had solved my problem. He gave yeah. me the scripture wow. I needed to do it in the moment. Isn't God so good? Yeah. So nothing became of that. I mean, it was good. I helped a few people, I guess, you know, but I didn't get invited to speak anywhere else. But he had planted the seed of go, show, and tell. So mm -hmm. started. So as I'm reading the Bible every day, you know how I look for patterns. I start to see everywhere. Where people are touched by God, they're not quiet. Yeah. Mary has the magnificent. Moses has chapter 15 in Exodus that talks about the graciousness of God. They all have it. Anyone who's touched by God, you can't be quiet. And so there's a pattern there. Go, show, and tell. Mm -hmm. So fast forward to 2020, and I call it the perfect storm. So um, Denise DeStasi is one of my clients. I love her. She's a writer, motivational speaker. And again, she got to know my story through the years. I got to know her story. And um, she came to me and said, when are we going to write your story? That book. Mm -hmm. And the second thing that happened is I had, sell, I had sold part of my business and had some funds that were way more than I ever dreamed of having. And they were earmarked for the Lord. The 10% of them was a lot of money for the Lord. And then the third thing was I was lamenting about the world. Oh my gosh, where are Christian voices? All you, if you came down from Mars and you listened to all the different areas where stories are told, you'd never know there was a God. Why don't we talk yeah. about God and Jesus and love and in the regular world? And yeah. I was just going off like this, right? My one of my guys in my men's group goes, "Well, why don't you just shut up and do something about it?" Yep, <laughs> right? saw that coming. Oh. So I had this money and I had Denise and I had this guy. And so I said, okay, Lord, you want me to tell stories and you want to start with mine. And so he put on my heart, start this ministry called Go Show and Tell. And it was supposed to be video, um, short story books. And then that book is what I consider a legacy book where mm -hmm. you, people can tell their whole story in God's, in God's picture of their life for their family. And for, you know, imagine if you had your, all your ancestors' stories written down. Wouldn't that be so cool? Yeah. So, and, and, and there are a few things that 
he put on my heart. One was you can't figure it out. You start telling stories. You can't have a whole business plan and have every means of publishing and distribution. Yep. And figure out. Just start to tell stories. And then the second thing he says, you must link these stories to people's identity. People want to, they're going to want to know the relational identifiers. Like I'm a son, I'm a brother, I'm a husband, I'm a father, I'm a grandfather, relational identifiers, and then professional identifiers. I'm a veterinarian, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm a pickleballer, I'm a gardener, I'm a fisherman. So all these levels of relationship, why? Because we don't know what that person, who they're going to, what part of you they're going to relate to, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Well, he's a veterinarian. I thought doctors were all atheists. No, no, I have more reason as a doctor not to be than to be. Mm. Um, so that's a whole different set of stories. And so ultimately, you know, you know, that we identity was really important. And the second thing is numbers, numbers. Let's get every story out there so that a doubting world after a while, they can doubt history, but they can't doubt your story. Your story is your story. Right. And they might call you crazy. We're not going to call 2 million Christians crazy if they're willing to share their story. They yeah. can't deny the spiritual realm. Like if, if Christians are willing to share the spiritual realm. Oh, so that's where we are. And we're, you know, we're still trying to figure out where to, to go with the ministry as we're about to publish the short story book. But um, I'm really excited because we're kind of looking at there's a lot of different small storytellers throughout the country that we're recognizing are like silos all over the place. And we're in a, in a movement now to bring them all together so we can get some momentum and storytelling. You know? mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah, that is neat. And, you know, I, 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 when you get your book published, let us know. We'll have you back okay. and we'll talk about that. That Appreciate that, that. Yeah, deep, deep dive into that. This is a great yeah. cursory over glance or look at the, you know, broad spectrum here. But I, I want to encourage everyone. Um, this book, From Broken to Blessed, is definitely something you want to pick up. Can we get this at Amazon, other yep. places? Yep. Yep. You can go to the yeah. website or go right to Amazon and get it. Yep. Yeah, Appreciate so that. Uh, this is a really strong book of encouragement because so many people don't understand that God is real. God's here. He's with you now. And he He wants you to talk to him. And then on top of that, he's he's more than a cosmic vending machine, but some people don't even ask him for anything, right? We don't trust him with our hopes and, and dreams. And I, the neatest thing I think, Paul, about this book is the evidence of God's action towards us when we submit, surrender, and obey him, that when we put the kingdom first, when we make our lives about his business, boy, is he all there for us. He's our number one fan. And then Michelle's got to sit in the number two fan spot, but she's doing a good job of that. So <laughs> that's awesome. Well, thank you so much for being a guest on what to say and how to say it. I think we learned some things today about how to speak to the Lord, how to be paying attention to where he is, and the journey that is so normal and there for all of us. He wants us to have life abundant right here, right now. Is there anything you want to leave our listeners with today? Well, just first, I want to, I want to thank you for the work that you're doing. It is really important stuff and um, you're, you're making a difference and, um, and, and, and know that that's true in your heart. And because um, if you're taking care of, of the kingdom, the people who need it and, mm -hmm. And so, you. no, and just, uh, no, just uh, encourage each person to understand that they're in a story and they're, and God's written it, but it's, you're part of that adventure and embody that. It, it really makes life and marriage, if you're married, exciting. Mm -hmm. And so embody that and, and, and uh, just uh, take it on with um, enthusiasm. That's awesome. Well, I want to encourage our listeners today to go ahead and tell your story to somebody, get some practice. Think of something that God's done in your life, a prayer he's answered, a, a beautiful thing that he's done that you're grateful for and share that with somebody because Paul's not wrong and neither is Rick Warren. It's not about us. It's about him. Thank you so much for coming today and uh, sharing some time with us. Be sure to pick up our next episode. Learn how to deal with conflict with uh, your spouse because you got a covenant and you got you to gotta fix it because everywhere you go, there you are. That next marriage is going to be a hot mess. So don't go there. Fix the one you're in. And I think that we got a really great example today of what the Holy Spirit can do in a marriage. And thank you so much, Paul, for sharing your story and for being on the show today. 
Thank you, Nina. All right, guys. We'll see you next time.